doing one. Oh, I thought we were doing one. Uh, I was doing two. Hey guys, Lucas here from T-Rex Arms. Today I'm joined by Mike of Grand Thumb fame. We're gonna be talking about our 10, 10.3, 11 and a half guns. We have Geisley rails on these and we're just gonna explain some of the accessories you put on these weapons, why we do so, and then we're gonna show you guys some B-roll of us running the guns as well. So Mike, why don't you start with your gun? Yeah, sure, so um, kind of the next evolution in the Mark 18 kind of family is going to be a different type of rail because the problem with the Picatinny, the DD Wrist 2 that you're running on a lot of Mark 18s right now is weight. So the Geisley rail is kind of a go-to, uh, not specifically on the Mark 18 right now, but a lot of guys running longer guns on teams right now are using the Geisley rail. So I think it's safe to assume that at some point they'll likely move to, move to the Geisley rail on the Mark 18. Anyhow, the, what's good about it is there's a lot of rails out there uh, in the industry, but not a whole lot of rails that can reliably hold zero with an IR laser, uh, IR illuminator and that type of stuff. So the reason I chose the Geisley rail um, was because of that strength and especially because of that ability to hold zero on the uh, IR laser slash illuminator. No. Yeah, and something, and something I want to mention about that, typically what he's talking about, about IR lasers holding zero, that's when IR lasers are mounted into the M-lock itself, so on the sides. And typically that's something we want to avoid due to zeroing issues. Sometimes due to real estate or what kind of hardware you have on the gun, you have to do that. But we're both put, we both put uh, malls, or mowls, however you want to pronounce it. These are mounted on the top, so it's not so much of a big deal. But if you're running a D-ball, an LA-5, or a PEC-15, and you've got to run it on the side because you want to get your thumb on top or whatever reason, uh, that's pretty important. The reason I really like the Geisley rail is it's, it's got a lot of surface area away from the barrel, so it takes longer to heat up. Absolutely. I've been using the BCM KMR a lot on my shorter guns, on my 10.5, my 11.5, and, and those heat up really fast. Like I just do a couple mags, two or three mags, and I've really got to start wearing one glove if I want to shoot that gun. So this is a little more spaced out from the barrel. It's a little more ventilated than the KMR, at least in my opinion. So I can shoot this a little longer without getting, getting it too hot. So that's something I really like. I'm running a front sight post on this gun. I'm running an EOTech, and those don't necessarily have the best battery life. So I'm playing with the new Scholar Works iron sights. So. Which, yeah, which iron sights for those again? Uh, Scholar Works. Okay, how do you like them? I like them a lot. I haven't shot with them a whole lot yet, but they're very minimalist, very lightweight. And uh, they're absolute height, correct? Uh, they're absolute, okay. and this is the EXPS3, so it's lower third, so it co is a little lower in the optic, which I like a lot. So if you look at my and Lucas's gun, uh, pretty similar. I've got the DD front sight post, just because I've been a big fan of it, but I like the uh, Scalar Works uh, front sight as well. Um, one question I do have for you, Lucas, is I run my back sight down. So what, ch what made you choose to run a fixed rear sight as opposed to a folding? Right. Well, I'm just playing with it. It doesn't seem to matter too much since this is a lower third optic. I'm usually putting the reticle high in the glass. I'm yeah. not putting it dead center. And I can do that with an EOTech because it, it's parallax free. There was that study that came out that basically said that EOTechs were the only red dot that was absolute parallax free. Yeah. So I can put that reticle up in the top. And typically, I don't even see my rear sight through the EOTech. All I see is the front sight. It's down the bottom. So not a big deal for me. I agree. So now with that uh, study that you referenced, that's from Green Eye Tactical, correct? Yeah, so um, just for your essay, if you want to check that out. Now, a couple other things, if you want to notice, uh, our weapons kind of same, follow the same kind of form factor. Uh, what made you choose the uh, Magpul uh, M-Lock versus some other M-Lock vertical grip out there? Just whatever you can find, or? I got it cheap, Yeah, that's, and it works. That works. But and one thing I will note, so this is an AR, this was originally an AR pistol. I'm running a brace, it's not an SBR. And the reason for that is I like being able to travel across state lines easily. Typically, if you have an NFA item like an SBR or a select fire, you've got to file a Form 20 with whatever state you're going into, basically notifying the authorities, hey, I'm bringing in an NFA item. It takes like a month or two for them to get back to you and say, all right, that's cool, bring it in. But for me, you know, flying up here in Oregon, I chucked this into a Pelican. I didn't have to do any paperwork at all. And so you might think, whoa, Lucas, like this is an AR pistol, but you've got a vertical foregrip. You go ahead and Google overall length of 26 inches. You can legally put a vertical foregrip on a gun over 26 inches. This is no longer a AR pistol. This is a firearm. I know it's stupid, but that's just what it is. And the reason I run a vertical foregrip it just puts my hand in a more natural position for manipulating lasers and lights. I agree. It's a lot harder, like if I turn my wrist outward like this on a short gun, it's just not comfortable uh, with time shooting a gun like that. So I like running a vertical foregrip. I can brace off of it, pull it into my body better, manipulate my light and my laser. I've got a Surefire M300 on here with a pressure pad, so I can come back to that very easily. Uh, muzzle devices, we're both running. He's got a can because he's special, I don't yet. 
I've got the Surefire War Comp on this gun. I've got a Warden that I've been playing with. I don't necessarily need this, but I'm just playing with it anyway. I run the, uh, the Surefire SOCOM 5.56RC. A big fan of the suppressor. Uh, put quite a few rounds through it at this point. I think it's at uh, about 25K at this point. Uh, it's been running pretty solid. Still running uh, good. Yeah, still running great. So there's a lot to be said about that. Now, how do you like the uh, Warden? I'll do a video on that separate. Um, it definitely serves uh, some uses. Usually this is on my 13.7 SCAR 17 uh -huh. because it's got ports timed at 12 o'clock and with 308, there's so much recoil, it's driving my muzzle down. So this just kind of neutralizes that recoil impulse and I can control it a little easier with this. Plus it adds weight, which helps keep the muzzle down and things like that. But I don't necessarily recommend this Particularly if you're running like a three prong, there's no reason to get this. Really the only reason to get one of these is if you're running like the Surefire Brake, you want to cover it up, or maybe the War Comp, but I don't really need this. But I've just been playing with it and seeing how it is. Uh, triggers. Yeah, what triggers, triggers definitely. So um, I'm a big fan of Geisley triggers. I know you are as well. Yep. Um, I think they're pretty hard to beat. They're very reliable. They use full power springs. So you don't have light primer strikes like you, you do with a lot of other aftermarket triggers without naming any names. Um, I chose the flat trigger face. It's, a, it's kind of a better feel for my finger. I think it's really subjective when it comes to that as yep. far as what you like. Um, my particular trigger is a super dynamic combat trigger. Uh, Lucas, you have the... I have the SD3G. And, okay. and the reason I chose that is I've been using SD3G for a long time. It's really good up close. It's a single stage trigger. A two-stage trigger is definitely a little more helpful when you start shooting distance. You can take up some of that weight, and then you have a lot less weight to break that shot. But up close, this trigger is unbeatable. money. Unbeatable, money. absolutely. So money. I'm a big fan of two-stage triggers, so I really like the uh, Super Dynamic Combat uh, trigger. That's why I chose that one in particular. Um, moving back, uh, talk about recoil systems, I guess, a little bit. Buffer springs and buffer spring weights and all that kind of crap. So I get asked a lot about that, and yeah. honestly, I really don't know what's in most of my guns. I just put whatever I get with the whole buffer yeah. tube kit. But in this gun, I've got, let's see what I have. I've got a, if this will even open, oh, the uh, bolt lock to the rear. I have an H1 in this gun, and uh, it runs fine. I really haven't played around with a lot of different buffers, but what you got. Um, you know, so I did a lot of research on this because um, I was originally running a DD, and DD barrels are a little bit overgassed, which isn't bad, it's just something that they did to run all ammo. Now, I've since moved over to the Roscoe barrel. Now, quick note about that, Lucas is running an 11.5 barrel, I'm running a 10.5 uh, inch barrel. So with the 11.5, you have some better dwell time, it's a little bit more reliable, and honestly, if you're not running a suppressor all that much, I would definitely recommend just running the 11.5. I think it's a lot better. Now, of course, you do have a little more sticking out. It doesn't look as cool, but still, definitely, definitely still Basically, doable. what we're saying is guys like to make a 10 and a half inch rail, yeah. and then it's gonna be money. Absolutely, but anyhow, moving back um, to my buffer spring and all that stuff, I use the Volter A5 system. So what it basically is, is it's a rifle length spring with a kind of a longer uh, a tube. And I'm running the standard weight that it comes with. I don't know that weight off the top of my head, but it's a much smoother uh, cycling on the uh, Mark 18 because the Mark 18 is a very violent system. Uh, it's very really hard with itself, especially in the 10.5 and 10.3 inch variants. So um, that's the reason why I chose that. If you are running a DD barrel, uh, you definitely probably want to go up in spring weight, especially if you're running a suppressor because that suppressor significantly increases that gas pressure coming back into the weapon. So you might need to kind of help counter that to ensure that you're not beating your gun up too fast because these parts are going to wear out fairly fast compared to like a 14.5 or a 16 inch barrel. Yeah. Something I did to my gun, which is something that Mike could do to his, is I put a law folder on my weapon. And the reason for that is I can now stuff this into a bag. And I went and bought a hydration carrier, actually. It was the only bag I could find that was the right length that didn't look too tactical. <laughs> and I can stuff this bad boy right into the bag. All I've got to do is deploy the brace, stock. It's a brace, but it's a stock. And uh, I can shoot that very effectively. So let's talk about, real quick, SBR versus AR pistols with braces. Okay, uh, honestly, uh, there's so many purists out there, and I deal with them all the time because I did that Mark 18 build a while back, who are like, you can't go pistol, but honestly, man, I don't think it really matters much. Uh, no, yeah. no, it really doesn't. I can control recoil with it in my shoulder really well. I can travel with this a lot easier. Yeah. No paperwork needed. I don't have to wait six or eight months for a, a stamp. It's just yeah. hard to beat. Obviously, you can't change the length of pull. You right. know, that's, that's kind of the downside, but at the same time, Honestly, it works good. So I'm, I'm actually a big fan of pistol builds, and I think I'm going to be doing one up here in the future because after using yours and getting some hands-on time with it, like 
definitely impressed with the uh, braces and how well they do. Yeah, and this and it's the whole market changed when SP released this particular brace. Yeah. There's a lot of surface area in the back that you can really get into your shoulder. So that kind of revolutionized it. The old Sig brace was fat and it was hard to put in your shoulder, particularly with kit. And then you had the Shockwave, which is too small. You didn't have enough surface area to control recoil very well. So this is my go-to brace. It works great. And I have a Voltor uh, receiver extension, and that actually prevents the brace from getting pushed forward too much, oh, shortening cool. my length of pull. You can also get a Midwest Industries that is uh, further back a little bit. Okay. And if you want to eliminate slop, I get asked all the time, like, how do you keep your brace from spinning? I just take gaffer's tape or electrical tape. I just pad it out and then I just shove this on there and this is not moving. Nice. The only, now I will say real quick, downside to running a brace versus a stock is uh -huh. if you go to clear a bolt override um, and you go to mortar your rifle, if you're into that, uh, the brace is not going to work as well as a stock. There's not as much rigidity. So that's something to think about. So now um, I get this question asked me a lot is regarding pistol grips. So oh. why I chose the Daniel Defense, uh, you know, what made you cho choose your, uh, your pistol grip? So for me, I like running my rifle, my length of pull a little bit shorter uh -huh. and like a traditional A2 grip angled backwards no just go. is no not go. body mechanically efficient. Did, I, did I say that right? It, yeah, it's hard on your wrist. It's hard on the wrist over time. So I like using BCM grips or the Magpul K2. It really just straightens that out. It's just a lot more natural. If I have a shorter length of pull, my wrist isn't getting any strain. And I have these on pretty much all my guns with the exception of my M16. Or actually, no, I did put one on my M16. Oh, you did. That's I right. did. I had to. <laughs> I just I couldn't run the A2. Uh, I'm running the uh, Daniel Defense. Uh, I get asked, you know, uh, why I use this one. I know it's not the most popular, but it's grown over on me over time. I really like the rubberized texture on the grip. It really helps me keep hold of it, especially I'm getting sweaty and disgusting and all that kind of stuff. So um, it's not quite as shallow as a grip that you have, but um, and that's the one thing I think I want to change. So I might be changing in the future, but uh, I think the Daniel Defense, if you already have a lower, it's going to serve you well, but I think there are better options. It's also got this rubbery stuff, which I, is kind of fun. I, I, I do like that. Like I said, uh, it, it's fun. The rubbery stuff is fun. It's I looking agree. cool. It's like all the battle, so that's a good reason to get the rubbery stuff. <laughs> okay, oh, so War Cops. Let's talk about the War yeah, Cops. Yeah, really let's quick. talk about that. Okay. Uh, you have yours right hand timed, right? I do. Okay, same. So we both have ours right hand timed. So uh, there's ports up here on the top, and those are going to redirect the gases. So people see that and they're like, oh God, it's asymmetric. What do I do? But that's the way it's supposed to be. And uh, again, when you shoot it right handed, that's really going to keep the gun extremely stable. Um, it works really well for me. I really am impressed with the War Comp. It's not really that disruptive to people around you. Like, it's doable indoors, it's doable with the team. Yep. Uh, so, I'm a big fan of the War Comp. Yep. Now, putting a War Comp on like a 14.5, which is what a lot of guys are doing if they've got, you know, an M4A1, they either have the front sight post or the mm -hmm. clear one. Uh, it's going to have a little less blast than this little 40 gun. Yep. Um, and that's another reason why the 11.5, I like that, is uh, it's, you just have a longer barrel. It's going to be a little less blast. So, that's, that's very convenient. I, th I think the 11.5 is definitely superior. I think we talked about that slightly earlier, but I yep. think. Definitely superior, man. Geisley just yeah. has to make a 10 and a half rail. They need to. So I have more real estate. I can move my grip out, move my laser down the barrel. So, Geisley. Geisley. Okay, so one, one thing is, uh, I've got a lot of questions about the pressure pad. So why do I use this versus the dual pressure pad? And I think it definitely depends on what type of IR weapon, uh, laser that you're using. So if I was using a PEC, uh, 15 or LA5 or whatever, um, it's definitely harder to reach around the top to activate that. So I definitely have a dual switch down here. Now with the mall, uh, I only need the switch for the light because my finger, when I go hands-on with this thing, is just in the right position to automatically activate whatever buttons I need. It's easy to control it. So I think that's a big uh, plus on the mall, and that's one reason I think uh, you see a lot of guys moving over to it. I've seen, um, mm -hmm. I've seen it in use on some unnamed units, so uh, I know guys are moving to them, and I think it's a... I think it's a great product. Yep. We'll definitely be doing some videos soon yes. talking about this system. I obviously spray painted mine because... Looking cool matters. That's right. And I want to be different. <laughs> so uh, optics, we're both running EOTechs. Yep. We're both Aimpoint fans. Um, I'll do a video myself on Aimpoint with EOTech at some point. I know you did one. Yeah. Uh, we, I got another one coming uh, because uh, I've cool. taken a lot more time to evaluate the EOTech. But um, it's, it's a good optic. It's it a works. great optic. I, I do like it. You do. In my opinion, though, if you're going to run an EOTech, you really do need backup irons because these do yes. not have the best battery life. It's yes. just due to how the technology works. So invest in some good flip ups or get fixed. I'm running fixed, doesn't get in the way. I've been running this gun fairly quick and I will it's been say working out. That there's, there's not quite a reticle that's as good as the EOTech is at CQB. Like, I think it's a superior reticle to the aim point. But with training, don't you think the aim point is just as fast? I mean, at the end of the day. At like, the end of the day? That's a, that's a good comparison. I mean, it's hard to have a control on that type of thing, but 
I think in weird shooting positions, asymmetric shooting positions, shooting from, you know, shooting at guys who are moving stuff, the circle is a huge help. Like, it's also clear. Uh, like a T1, from, I know we're going on a tangent, but the T1 is necessarily perfectly clear. It's got a little bit of blue tint. The MRO is a yeah. good example. That can be a little tricky when you're shooting at distance, which it has been for me. EOTech, perfectly clear glass. The T2 is pretty clear. Not as clear as an EOTech, so, but like I said, I'll do my own video at some point on that. And I guess you're doing another one. Yeah, absolutely. Now, um, one last thing before we kind of end here, Lucas. Uh, I've seen a lot of people who come to me and they say, hey, do I really need a Ford Assist? <laughs> Why not have Why one? Why not have a Ford <laughs> Assist? I see a lot of people trying to eliminate weight by going with an upper without the Ford Assist. Um, with the way the AR-15 operates, there is no reason not to have a Ford Assist on the rifle. It is necessary at various times and you should have it. Uh, I think that there's not really a, a I've used them on the flat range, not that that, I guess, matters, but it I've does. been like, it's yeah. nice to have this. Yeah, I think it's nice to have, absolutely. Yeah. So. Good stuff, and yeah. he painted his gun. I haven't painted mine yet, so. Soon. Yeah. You painted the, look, it's like inverse, like it, black it mall, painted mall. But you're gonna paint yours, red. so yeah. At some point, yeah. Of course you will. Absolutely. All right, guys, well, thank you so much for tuning in. I'm here with uh, Mike from Grand Thumb fame. We're gonna be doing some more videos in the future. Leave a comment um, in, the, I guess, the comment section, what other videos you'd like to see us do, other guns to talk about, shoot, whatnot. And we'll get together and we'll do some more stuff. So Absolutely. thank you so much for coming on. Oh, thank you. And uh, let's go, let's let's go, go slay shoot. some targets.